This is the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Rule number one is you have to believe in yourself. You're the only one who doesn't think you belong in this appointment. The prospect has already validated your existence by scheduling time with you. Get it through your head you belong here, go in there, crush it, and close the deal. A place where sales professionals can come to learn from other sales professionals and thought leaders that have mastered their craft. The difference between a good salesperson and a best-in-class salesperson is only two minutes. By spending an extra two minutes on what you might think is a mundane task in the sales game, you separate yourselves from the pack, you grow your book of business, you close more deals, and you retain your accounts. As well as their peers who are still striving for perfection to achieve their why. I have a wife and four kids. Failure is not an option. Real sales professionals. Real stories. Real results. Are you ready to feel the power? Office space in Anderson. And- hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Today, we have a highly touted commercial producer from Indiana, Mr. Eric Rich, comes highly recommended as a podcast guest. From the one and only work compologist. <laughs> so specialized he had to invent a title for himself, Mr. Steven Sedlak. <laughs> Eric, what's up, man? Not much. Well, actually a lot, uh, which is always a good thing. But uh yeah, just uh working away, getting after it after Memorial Day weekend. It's already halfway we're at hump day, man. <laughs> I mean yeah. Seriously, tomorrow's Thursday. We're on the glide path at five thirty tomorrow afternoon. Thank goodness. <laughs> it's tough, man. I don't. I don't like. I don't really like the short week. Honestly, I'd prefer. Well, I'd prefer the it's just a nightmare week. getting back into into things after the the holiday weekend because not only is everybody trying to do the same thing, so it's way harder to get stuff done and get a hold of people, but shit gets lost in the shuffle. Stuff that you comes in you know late on the the whole certificate thing that we were going back and forth on earlier yeah. today i mean that was just an oversight Nic- nicole said the same thing i said i was just like oh damn i thought that was totally handled based on her response and then you know we look at it today and she still needs some stuff so it, no, it's I a bit of a nightmare like a freaking sniper for a highly specialized message that needed to be delivered and then <laughs> back out of the engagement <laughs> I think the I think the biggest issue for me is I actually took the holiday weekend seriously and like took the holiday weekend. <laughs> you know, yeah, we completely unplugged, decompressed. Like, oh. I know I did my holiday weekend right when I wake up the day I'm supposed to go back to work and I've got like one eye open and it's like seven thirty because I'm only right. up by five. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I'm like trying to figure out reasons to stay in bed till like seven forty five or eight. <laughs> So this whole weekend, My largest this whole renewal weekend. was was five thirty one, and it was the most difficult renewal we've ever went through in my entire career. And so, yeah, trying to get that done before and then having the cleanup afterwards has just been you know how it is been a nightmare. I had one five twenty eight that was a little bit of a little bit problematic this year. That's a, a larger account for us too. What happened? In, what happened in your deal? Actually, before we even get into this, we'll talk about our war stories. But let everybody kind of know who you are, where you came from, how you got to where you're at. You started to tell the story, and I cut you off so that you could share it with everybody else. Otherwise, you have zero credibility with these people. They may think I just found you out in the parking lot. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, uh, you know, I was born and raised in Indiana. Uh, I graduated in 2007 from Ball State University, go cards uh, with a bachelor's in business. Graduate uh, in a time where they tell you you're going to get a job, no problem, making $50,000 a year. And you know, my mom's a teacher at that time. I'm thinking, wow, this is going to be great. You know, I'm, I'm right out of college. And of course, you graduate in 07 in 08 and everything hits the fan and there are no jobs available and you're calling all these people saying hey my professor told me i had this degree and you were going to give me this job and they said well everybody else has got a degree too plus they got 10 years of experience so uh, that's a tough time to graduate and find out what i was going to do um, worked for a couple different companies got into a sales role uh, which was actual hell to be honest with you uh, it was a copier company based out of chicago 
um, and it was a uh, boiler room atmosphere. Um, I'm talking, uh, if you were caught in the office between nine and four, you were fired because you're supposed to be out cold calling and prospecting and, uh, it's rough. My dad sounds familiar. My, yeah. Yeah. My territory was downtown Indianapolis. Um, it was grueling, but you know, I wouldn't take it back because it made me fearless to prospect. Um, I'll cold call anybody. Um, so I was kind of running from that job. Started working for a state farm agent um, and literally working out of the kitchen, uh, calling the phone book, selling a home and auto and life. And uh, I found out that nobody understands what they're buying. Nobody understands the product at all. 99% of people don't do it. And I think that's why people don't like insurance because they don't understand it. And I had a knack for explaining it to where people understood it. And then once I did that, they were okay with spending the money and they were okay with paying a little more for it. Mm-hmm. And so I said, I want to do this on a grand scale, a little bit bigger. And, you know, State Farm, they don't really have an appetite for that commercial. I remember the, the, the commercial underwriter took me to lunch and I was like, will you write this? No, will you write this? No. So I got on the independent side um, and became a commercial lines account manager uh, for a pretty large producer. Um, the, his account manager just up and left. The person that was training me was about, I don't know, five years past retirement she she was ready to go um and so it was a baptism by fire i knew nothing about the independent agency world knew nothing about all these insurance carriers knew nothing about excess and surplus lines brokers um and just kind of figured it out and i wanted to sell i just kept wanting to sell and so i ended up going to work for an agency uh in downtown indianapolis called mcgowan insurance group uh been around 90 years family-owned agency uh started working for them selling and um uh, Worked from there to 2007, 2012 to 2017. Grew a great book of business. Had incredible mentors. Um, I was approached by a local family that was friends of mine that owned a large oil company and said, have you ever wanted to open up your own agency? And I said, well, I'd love to do that. But at the time, I have three boys and no money. Hmm. Um, and if you want to open up an agency, you got to do it the right way. And so they said, we believe in you. Let's open this thing up. So with McGowan's blessing, which is it tells you the, the character of Hugh McGowan, um, he said, you have to do this. I believe in you. He sold me my book of business. He walked into carrier's offices with me and made sure that I got a contract, um, which was unbelievable. They're a Keystone agency. I uh, grew that agency from 2017 uh, to uh, just up till now. Uh, we had 17 people, 2.4 million in revenue uh, last year. Started from scratch, and McGowan approached me about seven, eight months ago and said, "We're doing some really special things. Uh, we we want you back. We'd love to have you a part of this. And we want to make you an owner." And so a lot of prayer went into that, um, but we decided to merge our agency back with McGowan on 1231, and now I'm a partner of McGowan. And so we've got about 100 people. Um, eight locations across the state of Indiana, licensed to do business all over the country. Man, there's a, there's a lot going on in there. I wanted to go back for a quick second on the, uh, the, the copier sales and the cold calling and how, you, you know, you, you said it kind of, you, you wouldn't take it back, but it was hell. What was like your biggest takeaway from that time period doing that? How, how long were you doing that? I don't remember if you said about six months. About six months. So, like in that yeah. six months, <laughs> it's like fifteen years doing it. <laughs> Seriously, else. I'm it's saying. Brutal. So, like, what was your biggest lesson or takeaway and all that? Like, that maybe still sticks with you today. You know, it just it gave me such a um, strong sense of grit. It showed me what my grit was. Um, you know, that even when there's things that you don't want to do, you know, becoming comfortable and being uncomfortable. You hear that about that all the time, right? And it was uncomfortable to have a hundred. Friday was was phone day. You had to have a hundred calls logged by five o'clock, or you were let go. Um, and they they counted your. It, it had, you had to get <laughs> They're not playing around up there. Yeah, you had to get you had to get someone on your phone for thirty seconds. They had to talk to you for thirty seconds before it logged as a call. And I was successful in doing that, even though when I didn't love what I did, I didn't necessarily believe fully in the product. I was young and I needed an income, and I was still very successful. It kind of taught me, like, if I can find something that I love and that I really believe in, I can be that much more successful. Um, so, but again, that grit of just not, I'm just fearless anymore when it comes to prospecting. You know, it doesn't matter. And pick up the phone, they tell me no. I don't care what they tell me. I mean, move on. I'm on to the next one. And so I'm glad that I went through that. You know, from my perspective, I agree with you wholeheartedly that Mr. McGowan has impeccable character to handle that situation 
the way that he did. He also has impeccable foresight. <laughs> you know, if you look at it, <laughs> hindsight being twenty twenty, because you know you had an itch that needed to be scratched, right? And mm-hmm. so if he could figure out a way to do that, the best of both worlds happens for everybody involved. But but what I want to say about that <clears throat> for everybody listening. From the agency principal's perspective, the reason he's willing to do that is because of his character, but it's also because you were upfront with him and transparent in what you were trying to do. <laughs> and the fact that you were willing to do that is something that is far less threatening than finding out that you were building this thing with the family from the oil company behind mm-hmm. McGowan's back the entire time. That would not have been anywhere nearly as well received. So kudos to you for being up front. And the reason why I want to highlight that is because there's a lot of people listening to this that probably aren't happy in the role where they're at right now, or they've always thought the grass is greener on the other side. And I have this opportunity. What you just heard was exactly how you should go about doing this. Doesn't matter how you've been treated in your agency. Doesn't matter how unfair you feel like the agency principal has the only person's actions you can control are your own. And if you're upfront about what you're trying to do, it's always going to work out best for you in the end, you know, regardless. You're either going to have a really successful agency because people are going to know that about your character and they're going to flock to do business with you. Or you're going to end up being able to build something and get to a point where you can then fold it back into where you came from. I mean, I think that's a that, that's got to be a huge win for all involved, right? Like you obviously oh. wouldn't have gone back there if you didn't enjoy working with McGowan. You know, you're so right, David, and I'll even go back a little step And when you're saying being full transparency. So one of my partners inside that business who were wonderful, they don't understand fully of the insurance industry, and they kept saying, hey, you need contracts. We should start talking to carriers about getting contracts. And I said, I, I'm not going to do that. I said, I will not talk to a single carrier until I tell Hugh McGowan what my plans are. And, and, that, and they were like, well, what if he just lets you go? What if he tells you to pound sand? I said, well, then I'll figure it out. That's fine. I said, but I have to be transparent. I said, I love him. He's been so good to me. And I owe that agency a debt of gratitude. And, and honestly, I, it took a lot to make that decision to do it because I loved where I was at. And so, you know, I went there and told him. I still remember the night. We still talk about it all the time. And then I always say the only reason why I'm back here and everything has went so beautifully is because of the way Hugh McGowan handled it and the way that I handled it. And I did love working here, so my mentor, I, I, I'm big on mentorship. As you can see, when we left, we started our agency. We called it Mentor Insurance. Um, and my mentor is here. His name is Mike Hyam. He's the best agent in the world. I've never met somebody better, uh, more client-focused. And when I started selling, I didn't know anything about it. And he just took me under his wing, never made me feel like an inconvenience. I drug him on appointment after appointment. Hmm. Some were great, some were terrible. Um, I'd sit in his office and ask him the dumbest questions and he never ever uh, made me feel like an inconvenience and so when I left it was hard to leave him um, I become so close with him it was hard on him when I left and um, he's a partner at this agency now and so we always worked really tight together over the last five years we were, they were like a sister agency to us we'd call each other and but it wasn't the same not being able to work together and so when this opportunity came to me to come back and be an owner it was so attractive to know that I'm now going to be a partner with Hugh McGowan. I'm going to be a partner with my mentor, with Josh Estel, with Todd Jackson. Um, and, you know, take a little bit of chips off the table, but also be able to uh, focus on what I focus on, what I'm good at. And it, what I was so happy about, I was actually driving the other day. I told a friend of mine, I was like, I finally have figured out what I'm supposed to do. I know what fills me up, what fills up my bucket, and that's selling and mentoring. And so I'm the sales leader of the organization. I have 20 producers that report to me, and I get to mentor a lot of these young guys that are on the front end of their career, and I get to sell and manage my book of business. And that's what I do well. And now I get that opportunity of doing that versus running everything else. Well, what do you find about the mentorship that really fills you up? Um, you know, I came from very, very, very humble beginnings. Uh, never had a father growing up. Um, my, my mother and my grandmother worked their tails off going to college uh, while I was young and watched them work hard. And so, um, you know, I, I, I never knew that I could even be in this position or have this type of success. I never knew this job was out there. I tell all my young producers, it's the greatest kept secret in the world. It's the, mm-hmm. greatest, it's the greatest job in the world. And um, my goal is to multiply that, all right? I want to give more people this opportunity to have a full flexibility of schedule, 
to go see your kids when you want to, to go coach your kids when you want to, to have unlimited income potential, to have real impact in people's lives and businesses, to be a partner at someone at a company's table. Um, and I just love, like, I don't know, introducing that to, to young people, unveiling that to them. Like, this is available if you're willing to work for it, right? And seeing that click, right, and start having that success. I get more excited when my, when my salespeople sell something than when I do. And that's saying something because I love selling. David, you ever heard anything like that before? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, man, I'm in the exact same place at this point. That you basically could have just described what motivates me every day. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested, though, as you see the younger, the new blood coming in, what differences do you see in that generation versus the people that are maybe 10 years ahead of them? Well, so my biggest thing is, is that, um, and I, I, I did a speech, I speak, I spoke at the uh, emerging leader or at the Keystone event the other day, and I was telling all the agency principals, I said, raise your hand if you've got young producers, and they did, and I said, the most dangerous thing that you have in your agency is walking past your young producer's office with the, when they have the door closed and thinking that they're okay, because a lot of times they're not. They've had a really rough week. Uh, they're, no one's calling them back. Their appointment's canceled on them. They can't get a meeting. They've pulled up Indeed.com three times on their phone, and they're looking for that salaried position. Well, thank God uh, they're not selling copiers, because if they're in their office with the door <laughs> closed, they'd have been on the street. <laughs> by uh, that's right. That's <laughs> right. But I, what the difference is is that you know people that have been doing it 10 years, they've seen the success, right? right? They, they, you can't look forward and connect the dots, right? You can't. But you can look back and you can connect the dots. You can say, I did this, I did this, I did this, and it got me to here. And so those people who have done it already can actually look forward and say, if I keep doing this, we'll keep connecting the dots. Some of these younger people, they just don't know, and there's so much rejection. And so I'm a big believer in sharing with them all of my failures, way more than what my successes are, to let them know that I'm still going through struggles myself. The younger people need more uh, I don't want to say coddling because that's not the right word, but they need they need you to be around more. You got to listen to them. Well, they you they hear. want you to listen to them, man. Yes. That's, the, that's the one thing that I would say above and beyond anything else. You know, if, if the legacy players in the agencies would just shut up long enough to li like, don't ask a question and then move on. Ask a question and listen to what the answer is. Because to me, that's a roadmap of how you're going to be doing business in another few years anyhow. You need to be mm -hmm. paying attention to the thought process. You need to be uh, paying attention to the communication style. You certainly need to, to, need to support. You know, I grew up in a, in a house where, um, you know, it was not always uh, – it was, it was about winning, man, period. Like you won, you win or you lose. It's not you win or you learn or anything like that in – my dad's an extremely competitive person, so much so that, like, he's the dad that when you're eight years old, he's still going to throw your shot four, seat, uh, four rows up into the bleachers oh, and point and scream at you because he wants you to know he's better than you are, right? Mm -hmm. Like, there were times I didn't necessarily appreciate that approach growing <laughs> up, and I still don't today for that matter. But that's what we're doing to these new people when we bring them in. Right. We, we want them to see we're the top dog. We're the best producer. We're the ones who have done it this way. It's always been this way. Yeah. You don't know what you're talking about because you've not been in here very long or whatever else. That is cancer to the culture of an organization that's looking to perpetuate. And that's the only thing I would add to what you said is, you know, it's not that they just might be having a bad day or whatever else. The truth is they they have a lot of value that they can add if you're just willing to listen for it. And, and just give them an ear. You don't have to adapt to every single thing that the, the millennial or beyond generations are recommending to you, but you better listen. Amen. Amen, David. And I tell, uh, I'll tell some of the, the seasoned producers, and I'll say, you guys got to understand something. These guys are coming in surrounded by producers with mountain-sized books of business. You've been doing this 10, 20, some of them 30 years. And they look at this and go, how am I ever going to get there, right? And they don't feel like they have a voice. And we have to give them a voice. We have to let them know that this is a slow go, right? It's, it's a slow process. Um, and I tell you, you know, my, 
I always uh, tout my mentor, Mike Hyam, and I give him so much props, but he'll come back in and say things like, um, no, you don't know how much you did for me when you were starting out. And his wife, who I've become very close with, she'll come up to me and say things like, he needed you. Like, he needed you in that, in that moment. You helped him. And, and that was him being, you know, open and transparent, letting uh, someone else who maybe hasn't been doing this near as long as him and try to learn from me, too. I didn't know it at the time, but um, I agree with you, David, 100%. So here's my question. is you were making the transition from boiler room, copier sales, horrific culture and environment into – becoming a, a commercial producer what were your first thoughts when you when you got in and, and realized what the opportunity really looked like um you know i was really excited um the people that have been doing this for a lot longer than me were it was so much different than the boiler room atmosphere uh, which it was there it was all about the money the money the money and these young guys claiming they're making all this money and then getting into the to the insurance world I remember I went to the first big eye convention and I saw this all these people and I thought wow I'm a part of something really special here like there's something different about this industry and then I just saw the value that we created for our clients the problems that we solved for our clients and that excited me um, I do remember being a little intimidated just because of commercial insurance being very complex and so many things that you have to learn. Um, but I've always been the type of person that, hey, I'm not gonna know it all, but um, I'll learn as I go. And I, got, I need reps, I need repetition. So I gotta get appointments, I gotta get calls, I gotta get meetings. Um, so it was really a lot of excitement um, when I got into the business and just seeing what I could build. And I looked at all the producers that were in the office with me and I thought, they're all great people. I said, but they're not, they're not special. I mean, none of them are much smarter than me. And, you know, all these, as if they can do this, then I can absolutely do this too. So, um, yeah, a lot of excitement. So what's the advice? You got a new producer that's coming in. You have a crew of 20 other producers. How do you welcome them onto the team? What's that first day look like for the new producer to make sure they get the full cultural experience? Yeah. So I'm going to sit with them and have a nice long conversation. I'm going to tell them things about, first thing I need you to do is I need you to be patient. I need you to realize that this is a long, long road, okay? And you're going to have days that are going to, you're going to rather flip burgers. And that's, that's how it's just going to be. I said, but if you can stick with this, it's going to be the best thing you've ever done. I'm going to encourage them to ask questions. Uh, the people who don't succeed, that are young in this business, they're so afraid to go ask a dumb question to another producer or someone in their office because they don't want to look like they don't know what they're doing, which is, that is a recipe for disaster, right? Ask so many questions at, right, constantly. I still ask questions, still call my mentor to this day. Um, and to use all of the knowledge that is around you, tap into it, right? Um, and I always tell them to immerse themselves into the industry as many classes as you can take, as much, as much as you can read, all of that. You're gonna to have to become a technician to stand out in this industry. So yeah, be patient, ask questions, immerse yourself in the industry. And you know, I love to have them, encourage them to meet with different producers and I like to tell them, ask them the question, talk to me about when you first got started. What was it like? What were your failures like, right? So you can realize, hey, that producer that's been doing it for 20 years, he was sitting in the same position that you were in, right? Some people may say, well, it was easier to sell then. I don't know if it was easier. I think it might be easier to sell now than, than it was then uh, because of technology. Hmm. And uh, you don't even have, I mean, I write business. I write a huge, uh, one of my largest accounts is about an hour, 45 minutes, or hour and 45 minutes northeast of you guys. Um, and, uh, you know, so you can write business all over the country uh, anymore. Um, so, yeah, it's a... Uh, yeah, that's interesting. I've never, I've never thought of whether it'd be easier to sell now or in the past. I mean, um, and I don't, I don't you know, know what, that man, it... I, I would honestly say, I feel like it's probably the same, you know, I, and the reason why I say that is I feel like if you, if, if you're a good salesperson and you really embrace the grind and you love the game, you're going to maximize whatever tools are available to you at that moment in time right yeah exactly so it's not like any of us 
we have our own approaches. We have our own value propositions or whatever else. But for all practical purposes, we all have access to the same tools of the trade. It's a matter yep. of whether or not the agency is going to make the investment into having that as part of their value proposition or not. I guess I'm wondering but, what you know what what exactly would make them think that about now just because there's so many well, more options out it, there I, and there's well i look at it this way right so here's an example of something that i used back way back when and i still we still use it today the coles directory the coles directory used to look yeah. like encyclopedia britannica right it was it came out <laughs> once a year it was alphabetized you pulled the volume out based on um alphabet it, or actually you could look up by zip code even mm -hmm. and you could find all the houses by zip code. There were several ways, but you literally, it was like dialing from a phone book. It was an old school phone book. When I sold satellite dishes, instead of me going door to door and having to worry about if a 12 gauge getting pulled on me, you know, <laughs> I realized that if I hammered the phones, I might not, I, I might not have the same penetration rate in terms of if I go knock on 10 doors in West Virginia, at the right time of the day, most of the time you're going to get nine or 10 people to answer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with the phones. You didn't, but I could cover so much more volume by not having to go door to door at the end of a street, then get out, drive to the next street and do all the things that I used to do. Right. That I used Cole's directory at that point to just cold call, just built a script, did my same cable interest survey that I did when I went door to door. And that's how I would call on people. How we use Kohl's today is it's web-based. It's interactive with the do not call list from the government. So it automatically scrubs people who don't want you contacting them. It gives you demographic information about the homes in the area that you're looking for. So again, I can still pull by zip code, but now I can export to a filter or to a, an Excel spreadsheet, put filters on it. And I can take out houses that are less than a quarter million and greater than 600,000 in specific zip codes. I can create a direct mail campaign using that list with automatic tasks created inside of the CRM to follow up on each of those via phone. I mean, I can go for days on all of this. At the end, at the end of the day, it's the same exact tool in a different format. At its, mm -hmm. it, at its root, it was a list of homeowners, their addresses, and their contact information in a certain zip code. It's right. morphed from paper format, Encyclop Encyclopedia Britannica format, to being online like it is today. And it's a whole different world. Does it make it easier? I don't think it does because that was the best version of that at that time. Mm -hmm. Right? Now... Was it easy for it? Was it easier for me than not having it? It absolutely was. But I still had to go into the office. I still had to plan my day. I still yeah. had to make the calls. I still had to keep notes. I still had to follow up on the people I didn't get the day before. So it goes back to every, I, I say this almost every single time I talk about bringing people in to the industry. These are the things right here. Show up when you say you're going to show up. Do what you say you're going to do. Answer your emails and your voice messages in a timely fashion. And number three, if you don't know the answer, don't make it up. Admit you don't know the answer. Go find it and then get back to them with the correct answer. As long as you're not doing that five times in every meeting, then you're going to be fine. <laughs> but, right. if you can, but if you can do those four things you're already light years ahead of everybody else in the industry that you're competing against because people are habitually late. They don't return voicemails and emails in a timely fashion. They don't follow through and do what they say they're going to do. Then they tend to make things up on the fly instead of just, you know, being humble enough to admit you don't know everything. That's right. Do those That's things right. and you're going to be perfectly fine. It doesn't matter what tool you have at your disposal. The reason the tool worked is because I was using the tool. So many times agencies go buy and invest in stuff. Yeah. Like, I can't tell you the number of people who would tell you that the, the, the Kohl's information, the Kohl's directory is a bad investment. It's like seven or eight hundred dollars a year. That's all it costs. If I get two right. homes yeah. or a home and an auto out of that, I've already paid for my year's subscription. They tell me direct mail is dead. 
you guys have seen firsthand when we do direct mail campaigns that we get really good, de- I mean, decent response from them. Mm-hmm. We had one lady call and ask us not to mail her anymore because she didn't want us wasting the paper. Like, all right, well, apparently you got my postcard. <laughs> hey, speaking of paperless, did I mention which carriers we have that have paperless policy <laughs> delivery, right? I mean, like there's <laughs> – but it, it goes to – you have to have a certain passion and desire to be in the role that you're in and want to be the best that you can be. You have to have a certain amount of natural ability. You have to be willing to make yourself better and invest in your own success by sharpening the saw. And you have to be willing to try new things and, and actually use them, right? The agencies that think the Coles directory, directory is terrible think that because they thought they were going to pay seven or 800 bucks a year and all of a sudden Cole's directory is now a producer for them that's going to bring in 40,000 in revenue without them having to do anything <laughs> with it. that's not how this stuff works so that's why that's why I say to me when people say well it might be easier to sell today than it was back then it may appear that way but I, I just think that if you're at the top of your game for whatever the time frame is you're in the game you're it's always going to look like it's easier for you look at the look at Greg Maddox man the guy, the guy didn't have the best fastball. He very rarely even threw curveballs and sliders. Fastball changeup, period. Mid 80s, low 80s, high 70s, and that was it. Focused on control, focused on consistency, was durable, always showed up. One yeah. of the greatest pitchers that we'll ever see in our lifetimes, in our in our lifetime. And it looked easy for him. It didn't look like he was even working when he did it. But to see the results of somebody that's that on top of their game, it's both refreshing and could be intimidating at the same time. So I think it's it's really good, Eric, that you have people that can talk to newer producers that aren't afraid to talk about what their story was like. You know, I was on the phone with a guy earlier today that wanted to talk about killing commercial. And I told him, I'm like, I've walked in your shoes. He goes, no, you don't understand. I just opened my agency. I don't have any employees. I don't have an office. I don't have carrier contracts. You don't I'm understand like, that, dude. I'm like, <laughs> son, did I stutter? Like, <laughs> what what part of I've walked in your shoes was I not clear on? I said, trust me, been there, done that. I, I get yeah. it. So, I think that's a yeah. huge piece. You have to have, you have to have people in the organization that are willing to share the story and make them accessible to newer producers. And that's, that's tough, man. I mean, I'm sure your culture's on point where you're at, but I see a lot of agencies all over the country and it's not that way. Everywhere. Well, you know, it, it, you're, you're right. One, one thing I'll, I'll add to this, which is funny. You were talking about the, you know, show up, do what you say you're going to do. I always tell my agents too, a good agent is not afraid to share bad news with their client. And, nope. and I say, get it out in the open as soon as possible. Get it out. You know, if you if you got something coming up on renewal and it's 90 days and it's going to be a problem, call the client and share it with them right now. Because too many agents, and you learn this from experience, right, myself, you think you can fix it. And you try to fix it and you try to fix it and it eventually becomes a problem and they didn't know about it, right? Um, and so I think that's one of those, those great uh, reminders as well. But, you know... When I first started here at McGowan, it was, and they'll tell you this, it was that type of culture where every agent that was here, they were been doing it forever. Mountain-sized books of business, and I was kind of in a silo just by myself. I sat in an office. I remember I looked out the window going this way, and I said, well, I don't have anything to do. I guess I better call somebody, you know, and that's how I got started just by baptism by fire. And so I had to go out and be active and asking each one of them and sitting in their offices and pulling the information out of them, which once I did that, they were more than happy to help. They enjoyed it, I think, too. But that's the problem. A lot of agencies, they don't encourage that right now. And we're trying to create that collaborative approach among the sales team. So I have a producer meeting once a month, which is more formal. Here's what's going on in the agency. Here's some things you need to look out for. And then I'm creating a separate one that's going to be off-site, that's going to be more relaxed, have some cocktails. Let's talk about what's going on. Why do you suck, right? You know, <laughs> I, what you say, I suck. I can't get an appointment for, for three weeks. I haven't got an appointment. Okay, let's talk about it. Why? And someone else goes, I haven't either. It's good to know that you're not alone, right? We're all in this together. Yeah, one of the things I've been talking about a lot lately is the fact I think agencies miss the boat on how they manage producers and they manage them too reactively. Um, and what I mean by that is it's always the end of the month. It's always the end of the quarter or the end of the year when they already haven't hit their goal. Mm-hmm. 
well, it's a little late to be asking, like, why you haven't hit your goal after you've already missed it. When if you have the right behaviors defined for what you would expect of each of your producers, you can hold them accountable to those behaviors on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Mm -hmm. And with relative certainty, know that the production is going to follow that. Right. Like you don't define behaviors that aren't going to lead to production in your agency. You want a behaviors that are going to lead to it. Telephone calls, marketing, uh, emails, handwritten notes, you know, dropping <coughs> in and do cold call drops, all of this stuff. These are all behaviors that lead to revenue mm -hmm. and they're all trackable, especially if you have a CRM, it's, it, they're all trackable. So why in the world do we not take advantage of that? I think that's to me, that's one of the biggest things that I see across the country is agencies just don't understand that if they can define their sales process and the behaviors that go with it, and you hold your staff accountable to that, mm -hmm. you're going to have, you're going to write way more revenue than you'll ever write. If you just leave them to their own devices, you know, I was in, I was in multiple States over the course of the last probably 30 days. And every time I got up and spoke, one of the questions I asked was, how many agencies in here have a defined sales process? Yeah. And very few raised their hand. I was in one state and Mick Hunt was up speaking and he asked how many agencies had a CRM. One guy in the entire room raised his hand and we found out that was AMS 360. So it wasn't even really a CRM. He just didn't one? realize what we were asking. One person in the entire room. And agencies are wondering why they struggle to get sales, why they struggle for follow up, why yeah. we have a bad reputation. That's crazy. What are you drinking? <laughs> it's uh, it's just it, it's called black. It's like black water. It's it's got a bunch of minerals. Good pH balance, you know, a lot of uh, good, good uh, alkalinity in there. You know, some fulvic, fulvic you minerals, get a for a free bottle amino acids. Yeah, did you get a coupon for a free bottle of that when you bought your Birkenstocks? Birkenstocks? No, don't you dare put me on the Birkenstocks. I don't. That's I don't. I don't roll like that. No, I've been. This stuff's actually pretty good. I mean, it didn't. It it it's literally just tastes like water. But um, you know, they got it the old green wise. So, but anyways, um, yeah. No, I I, I think um, it's funny. I laughed when you first started talking because I. I just, like it's not specific to this industry. I mean, maybe the CRM stuff, but like just the, having the conversations at the end of the month when people haven't hit their number. And like, I talk with my wife every, at the end of every month, she manages the team at ADP, you know, doing payroll. And um, it's always somebody at the end of the month that's scrambling that is below their number that is wigging out causing problems about some deal that's not the right deal to begin with that's right, not working they're, out they're clinging to it like that's their whole future depends and it's on that yeah. one deal 100 percent, and it's you know this person's fault you know and man it's it's my wife's fault that the deal's not going through it's implementation's fault it's so but it's 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 never anybody's fault but their own and it's you know it's i just i just thought it was funny because we were just talking about that this this weekend yeah so like I just, I don't understand it. To me, it's an easy problem to solve. First, define your sales process. Second, teach it to your people. Yeah. Third, hold them accountable to it. You don't have to have technology to do that, right? Like it makes it so much easier if you have a CRM. Mm -hmm. But if you want people to do 30 cold call marketing drops and visit businesses every week, have them go fill out a profile on each one of those businesses with notes of what the visit had and you could sit there and review hard paper every single week if you want to. I mean, it's not going to take you long to figure out that your time is worth more than you oh my investing God. to read that. Well, I told you, you when, you know, during the office supplies like that, we like we didn't have a CRM. My CRM was these little like they were called tracking sheets and they were they you could fit like 15 businesses and decision makers names. And you could there's like a little spot for notes where you could write like maybe what kind of printer they had or what toner they use and so on and so forth. But it was like, I mean, I'm sitting in my car shuffling through these, <laughs> these papers in my territory every morning, trying to figure out who I need to go back to. And did it work? Sure. But did it take more time than was necessary? Definitely. Did I waste a lot of time sitting there in my car trying to remember 
shit, I didn't write down this person's name. What was the, what was their dog's name? Where was the, where was the kid going for camp this summer? Like, and you know, all, all of that stuff, obviously much easier to track in a CRM. Um, you're not going to lose it or spill coffee on it or whatever, but. Or your black water. Or yeah, you're not going to spill black water on it. You know who has it all figured out? The copy machine guys. They're not reactive at all. In fact, they'll no, fire you before you done. even apply for the job. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've got, you know, what's funny is I didn't even know it. Black water's for closers. It a huge employment practices liability claim. I mean. <laughs> yeah, was, seriously. The emails that I had still <laughs> in my inbox that they would send us were awful, awful atrocious cussing at us it's funny you know, i never knew anything about back then i was just like i gotta get out of here so right <laughs> yeah you just do you didn't like getting cussed out yeah yeah, yeah not at all. so what um what would you say is the biggest mistake that you see newer producers making um you know uh i'm a big person on persistency I always say that's the number one thing you have to be in this business. You got to be persistent. Um, and I feel like they think they need to succeed right now. And if they don't get that appointment or it didn't go well, that oh, they just feel like such a failure. And I'm like, you know, you're planting seeds that you're going to harvest five to six years from now. It's like some of my biggest accounts took me three, four, five, six years to, to win. Sure. And, you know, just trying to encourage them to be patient. Um, they get a little too worked up when they just have they go into some, some rejection on that. But also a big mistake is they feel like they got to know everything. I cannot stand when I listen to one of them cold call and they get nervous on the phone because they think that this person on the other phone on the other end of the phone knows that they don't know what they're talking about, right? So they get nervous and they try to validate themselves on the phone by puking everything they can think of about their agency and how big they are and what they do. And that client could care less. He wants to get off the phone right now and they end up working themselves completely out of an appointment because they're vomiting on the phone because they're nervous. And I always tell them, look, you've been in the business for, I don't know, three months, you know more about insurance than they're ever going to know. Okay. Um, they're not, they don't know how much, you know, the goal of the phone call is to get an appointment. Okay, it's to get an appointment. Unless they're willing to be more, you know, uh, talkative on the phone with you, get to the point why you want to meet with them, what you think you can, you know, what you what, you're going to bring something of value for them, and get the appointment and get off the phone. And sometimes you'll actually hear producers get the appointment and then they'll talk themselves out of the appointment because they stay on the phone, they keep talking. Exactly. And it's like hey, they agree to the appointment, sit, send the reminder, send the invite, get That's off it. the phone. Um, and I feel like that's a big. Uh, mistake that I see him make. I don't know if I, oh, I was saying that um, it's kind of the same thing, man. And, and we talked about this a few weeks ago, but um, you know, a, a lot of times I would get people that were newer in and they were trying to sell these office supplies and they would, they would drop the clothes and they would get the person to agree to buy some paper or whatever it was. And then instead of just taking the order and starting that process, like, okay, we closed them. Now we're you know, we just need your, your business card, jump on the, you know, online and, and we'll take care of this. Like they would just keep talking and talking. And then the buyer would be like, you know, I don't know that I have enough time for this right now. Why don't you, you know, give me a call back another time or whatever. And it was like, you talk yourself out of the sale. Just, you right. gotta, you gotta end it once you get the, uh, you know, w- w- once you get the buy-in and, and that's it. Yeah. No, it, and, and, you know, per, per, we were talking about persistency. Um, so, so several of my accounts that I've got that are my closest relationships just took me, you know, so long uh, to, to get. And one in particular, I was talking about it earlier, Dave, when you are bringing up war stories. It's one of my favorite stories, um, and it's my closest relationship uh, from a client standpoint. Um, I always think a great thing to do, and I encourage people, is to find a friend that's in sales in a different industry. Uh, especially when you're growing your book of business because you can get on the phone, you guys can, you know, share your frustrations and stuff like this, but you can also share leads. And I had a good friend in the life safety uh, business and we would call and talk all the time and he called me one day and said, you got to check out this guy. He's, you know, it's a bunch of apartments. He seems like a really, really nice person. You need to reach out to him. So I have a very unique uh, marketing, uh, I mean, uh, email marketing program that I do. I send a specific email 
Um, and three of my largest accounts that are over a million in premium all came from this email that I sent. Uh, and it's a unique email that I send and then I uh, usually get a response back and then I do a follow up uh, with calls. But I sent this guy an email, he got back to me and said, hey Eric, you seem like a great guy, um, but I don't need your services. And I said, not a problem, you think we can stay in touch? We went to lunch about eight months later. He was like, wow, you're a great guy, I really like you and I really liked him too. He says, but I still don't need your services. Um, and then he just emailed me one day and said, hey, I'm having some problems with my workers' compensation. Think you can help me? Absolutely, I can. There you go. And uh, we got in, won the account, um, and it, it, that was eight years ago. And two years ago, he baptized me. And so that tells you, like, the, the weight of that relationship of what that grew, um, you know, throughout that process. Um, and it was such a hard account to win, and it was a hard account to continue to keep. And um, it's the renewal I just went through right now, um, which was the, the most 531 or whatever you were saying. 531. It's there you 30, go. It's 3,300 uh, apartment units across the state of Indiana, all frame, built in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, unsprinkled <laughs> with claims, two fires last year. Um, and so talk about the most difficult thing in the industry to place right now. And, um, you know, we, we got it done. And when I went there, I was able to, to be, you know, confident to say I, I poured every ounce of energy I had into this. And, you know, I love that guy. He's more than just a client to me. He's more than just a friend to me. He's a brother in Christ. He's been a huge, um, you know, point in my life and my walk with Christ. Um, and so it's just the persistency of, you know, staying after it and not giving up. You know, I thought I, I said this, I've said this a million times. I thought I was cold calling for business, but, you know, I was cold calling for salvation, which is so cool. Uh, and the fact that I never knew that just this, this persistency would lead to more than just business, but this relationship that I have in my life. Uh, and they become my one of my anchor accounts. And you know what that means when you have an anchor account, which is someone who always believes in you, uh, you know, will send you people, refers you business. And he's helped grow my book of business so much over the years, too. And so that persistency is just something that I think a lot of people that come into the business, they just don't have it. Uh, you know, they, 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 if they don't get the success in the first year or two years, they just want to give up. And this is a long road. It's awesome. Yeah, it's always interesting, man, when you go to the mat for your clients and then it comes to a point sometimes just through circumstance that there's not much more you can do to help them. I mean, I, we were talking about the war stories, but I went through a similar situation with an account that I've put a ton of work into over the course of the last four or five years. And unfortunately, they had two shock losses happen last year. They were legitimate shock losses. And I'm usually relatively credible when I pick up the phone and talk to an underwriter and can get them to see my point of view. And this, mm -hmm. is, a, this is a wild situation. This is a resort. The resort had um, eight modulars that had been fused together into one big one. Kind of freaked me out originally, but apparently that's a thing. It's not out of the ordinary. And that's where their housekeeping hmm. department ran from was for this one giant modular building but they had a fire last spring this is the only account in my book of business that i only write one line of coverage for workers comp this is all i write mm -hmm. because they're in a captive for everything else it makes all the sense in the world for them to stay there not even gonna attempt to try and talk them out of it i'm happy with the piece that i have and that's plenty to keep me busy they had a fire and they lost the last three of those modulars that were attached and they had to move their housekeeping and laundry operation over to a building that was an older building. It was next to administrative offices on property, but it wasn't used. So the ingress and egress and all of that was unkempt compared to what they were used to, uh, to seeing. We had one guy, these, these claims happened within just a matter of a couple of weeks of each other right before the policy period expired. So they got boom, boom, right at the end. They, they tripped in a parking lot. Two different people tripped in the parking lot. One of them tripped, landed on both knees. Three knee surgeries later and over $100,000 in paid claims were dealing with the problem. The other guy wasn't so lucky. He landed face first. He tripped uh -huh. on a seam in the parking lot, landed face first, had to have a jaw procedure done, lost teeth, all kinds of crazy stuff. Things you don't really think about, right? Like you're not expecting to go to work, trip on the par in the parking lot and fall flat on your face when you're and leaving jaw the house surgery. that morning. And so I had lost control from the carrier come out. We showed them. Now, 
one of the reasons why I preface this with the fact that I only only write the workers comp is because that's the case the client never thought to call and tell me hey we had a, a little bit of a fire over here that affected some of our property mm -hmm. and all of that stuff right so I didn't know or I could have gone over and been part of this ahead of time because we are very proactive in terms of what we do from a risk management perspective but I went over and the carriers here, you know, I don't know how much you know about comp in Florida, Eric, but it's state administered pricing. Yeah. And we don't have debits and credits, but you can do consent to rate. So every single carrier was looking at, well, here's what we have the loss pick figured out as let's back into a profitability, um, a profitable number by just using consent to rate. So everything came in well above manual premium, like double manual premium. And to your point, I never gave up. I kept fighting. I went to carriers I normally wouldn't go with, carriers we don't have a ton of business with because we just don't have the same relationship that we do with others. And sure enough, because I did my job, we found one of those carriers we don't have a lot of business with that was willing to put them on an incurred. They gave them two different options, paid loss, incurred loss, retro. I told them to take the incurred. It made more sense financially for them to do that. And they're, they're basically their normal premium came out at manual with the top side on the retro of being, um, you know, 125%. Well, guess what? Their worst case in the top side of an incurred loss retro is about, you know, 75%. <laughs> or, it, it, you know, it, it's the, they were 100 per, looking at 100% increase. They saved 75% off their next closest guaranteed comp quote, even with a dividend. And most of the comp carriers weren't willing to give the dividend. They didn't want to take the risk. The whole thing came down to, do I know my client? Did I understand what happened? Did I get engaged to try and find a solution, not only to the immediate problem of having that stuff taken care of and the parking lot repaired, which was extremely inexpensive, and then did I have the right conversations with the carrier and the, and the claims people and the underwriters and all of that, and then did I quit? And the answer is mm -hmm. I did everything I was supposed to do in that scenario. And as good of a job as, as I felt like I did, I still was sleeping with one eye open at night. You know, yep. that's not a that's not a comfortable position to be in. I wasn't blocked at a single market that I went to, which usually that's a major bonus, right? Because now I know they weren't shopping against me. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't blocked at a single market. And... Uh, I just kept pushing through, pushing through, and, and I actually had gone over and had the bad news meeting with them up front. I warned them it was going to be a bad news meeting. I told them this isn't where we're going to end, but I want you to see where we're at. And sat down in person, and, man, you would have thought I shot their dog when I gave them the information. And they said, you better, you better sharpen your pencil and get back after it. And I'm like, hey, your loss ratio over yeah. the course – you know, there's only so much I'm going to be able to do. And honestly, we it was I really feel like it was just my lucky day that day. We got a carrier that we don't have a relationship with to put something up. Well, you, you, you know, you're an at your advocacy right there. Right. You're an advocate for your client, which is um, so important. That's what we do. And I think that we as an industry and producers do a really poor job of explaining to our clients what we do. They don't know what we do. They have no idea the amount of emails, calls, research, conversations, story, telling their story. They have no idea the amount that goes into that. And I realized that when I was in my early career, I would uh, I would get the policies and I'd get some information and I'd, I'd get out of there because they didn't want to bug the client anymore, right? And I'd show up, you know, 60 days later with my quote expecting to get the business. And they, they have no idea how I got that quote. So I do a j good job now of telling my client everything that I've done for them, keeping them on track throughout the week. Here's what we've done. We've had this many conversations. I'll tell them up front, Mr. Client, you're... If I'm going to try to win your business, this is going to take me probably 50 man hours. I want you, it's about 50 man hours. So are you willing? Are you willing to commit some time to me as well too? So they they don't know that. They think we go in the back room and we pull out a quote for ABC Company. Um, they don't know that all the work that we're doing behind mm -hmm. the scenes. And you know that account, this account that I just went through. I mean, I can't even begin to tell you how much de how many declines we got. And we had this standard carrier, believe it or not, that was saying they're going to entertain it. 
they declined it. I got asked to go on a trip to, with them uh, to the Caribbean uh, several weeks ago, and I was there. And I, the head of underwriting was there, and I, I sat at a table with him, and I said, you, you deny it, you decline this. I want you to take a second look at it. We scheduled a breakfast the next morning for my, me, my wife, him, and his wife. We sat and talked about the, the risk for an hour and a half. Your wives loved that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're like, yeah, his we're going to go to the pool. His wife actually worked for the carrier, too. So, But, but you know what? My wife, she, she, she's the most supportive, best woman in the whole wide world. Uh, she knows what the job requires. Um, and uh, that carrier came through at the very last minute. I couldn't believe it. With an incredible property rate, we delivered about a 58% increase on the premium, which is phenomenal because it was looking at about a 130% increase. Mm. Yeah. Man. Yeah, it's crazy, man. I mean, all that to say, don't ever give up, man. You that's mean, right. Seriously, that's the main, that's the main piece. And I mean... You know, you and I don't really know each other, but I can tell we're cut from the same cloth completely. I mean, the philosophies line up, habits line up. You know, I just, I, it doesn't matter. I don't care if, in some of it's DNA, right? I don't care if the deal's $500 or $500,000. I'm going to celebrate the win. I don't want to get my rear end kicked. And it's funny because I got a big dose of humble pie when we launched personal lines, you know, and I started realizing very quickly. My sales style does not translate to Susie homeowner. It does not mm -hmm. translate, you know, to Johnny homeowner, period. Like these people get pissed if their homeowners goes up 20 bucks a year and they expect you to reshop it to every single market that mm -hmm. you have. Yep. And I'm like, this, this isn't me, man. This is, I, we, I, I can understand why the industry has been placed in this com commodity box, right? Where it's just a, it's a commoditized transaction, period. I get that. But you know, it's 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 crazy to think that, um, you know, I, I also talk about this quite a bit. You mentioned it. We don't do a good job of explaining what we do. I mean, we don't do a good job of explaining how to do business with us either. Like, forget about what happens behind closed doors. Most of our clients have, I mean, there's no formal training program for how to buy insurance for my business, <laughs> right? You don't right. take a college course or a high school course. These people are weathered by the market and the agents that call on them. That's how they learn how to do it. So, you know, if you're a value-based seller and you get upset because you're calling on somebody and they're giving you all the signals that this is a price deal, quit just trying to sell value harder. You're not explaining something that's not clicking or they're just always going to be a price buyer. It may not be the right prospect for you right. because of that. but. <laughs> I've been involved in discussions in some of the forums online before where, you know, people will make the comment, oh, I'm not wasting my time taking that first appointment. I'll take every first appointment, right? Because that get, if, if this is what I know, there's a hundred percent chance I'm not going to close it if I don't go to the first appointment. Number one, True. more importantly though, if I go to the first appointment, that is the one shot I have of sitting across from somebody eyeball to eyeball and being able to educate them on why we're different, why we choose to do things the way we do. Not from a selfish, let me regurgitate everything about Florida Risk Partners to you, but more along the lines of just being consultative in your approach, talking to them about their policies and procedures and things that they have in place, things that they don't have in place that they probably should, and casually just using storytelling to explain how you solve that need for somebody else. But it never needs to be in your face it never needs to be let me tell you all 437 things that make florida risk partners different from everybody else that's not the case but i can go in and talk about light duty return to work tell me about your return to work program what does that look like well we've got this oh so do you have this as well and meanwhile the whole time you're asking questions that don't seem selfish but yet they're coming to the conclusion this guy really knows what he's talking about nobody's asked right. me this before this is a little bit concerning to me that I don't have this or I've not heard of it. Let me ask a follow-up question. And if you do that and you engage them in conversation, you're going to be so much better off. But it's our job to educate people in how we do business. That's why the whole 60 to 90 days before renewal is such a fiasco. But yet people take the calls. That's what we've trained and conditioned them to do. Think about this. How many agencies out there, producers, I'm talking to you. How many people out there have an, on, an actual onboarding process. 
that's consistent across each client in each segment of your business. And then we get upset when somebody picks up the phone and calls to ask for a certificate instead of using the fillable form that we told them to bookmark or that we should have told them to bookmark because we have something online that makes it easier or that they have the ability to pull their own certificate from eCerts online faster, but we never took the time to explain that to them. We just mentioned it in the sales process. Every single person who comes on board with Florida Risk Partners gets a drip email campaign over the first two weeks of being a client that tells them exactly what they need to do to do business with us, what the expectations should be, who they need to talk to for what, reinforcing that they made a good decision, and all of that. But how many agencies don't do that, right? They write the deal and they're on to the next thing. And retention starts the second you write the account. It's not yep. any other time. Your job to retain that account starts the second you get the bind order because new business is over. Now it's your renewal. And what are you going to do over the course of the next 12 months to get that renewal? So, dude, we could sit here and talk for hours. I, I honestly <laughs> Yes, we could. That. Yes, we could. So we're, yeah, we definitely, we need to have you back. Any parting comments before we wrap up? I know you're in the middle, you know, you, you were kind enough to, to step out in, in foreign territory for all practical purposes to do the podcast. Any parting comments before we wrap up and let you get back to your day? You know, just for anyone that's listening, uh, I've talked about it this entire time, is just uh, be patient in this business. And, um, you know, my mentor always told me, Eric, there's a lot of people in this business that don't work very hard and are not good at their job and they make a lot of money. So just imagine what you can do if you work hard and care. Um, and it's just a long road and it, it is worth it. If I can, that's my final comment. It is worth it to stay in this business and grow it. Um, because what you can provide for your family, the life you can provide and just insurance has just been so good to me. Um, but you know, if I didn't work through it, if I didn't be persistent, I'd have never known. Amen. I don't Fair know enough. I can say anything any better. Kyle, take them home. Cool. Hey, everybody, if you like this podcast, please throw us a like, throw us a review, a little Google, a little Google like, thumbs up, give us something. We'd appreciate it. We appreciate you listening. We will catch you next time on the Power Producers Podcast. See you. Awesome. Thanks, guys. You've been listening to the Power Producers Podcast. You can follow Killing Commercial Insurance on Facebook and YouTube. And if you want to take your game to the next level, next level, check out our book, The Extra Two Minutes, and our website, killingcommercial.com. <laughs>